stand with me this morning. Turn to hymn number 295. I will sing the wondrous story. Let's lift it up on the first. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ. Welcome to Bellevue Baptist Church. Glad you're able to attend with us this morning and uh, just go through. Uh, first, we've got a number of people out sick, so if you could just be in prayer for them. The flu is pretty nasty and uh, going around, and so we want to be in prayer for, uh, for those. And uh, next, we have our business meeting. That is January 26th. That's at 5.30 p.m. That means Sunday the 26th, we will not have evening service here. We will have it uh, at Foundation Baptist Church in Sammamish at the Central Washington University campus. So 5.30 the 26th, not here, but uh, at Central Washington University. And uh, so glad to be here. And that means also we've got our financial reports on the front, so you can go ahead and pick one up, grab one. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, another announcement is we have our, our men's kind of marriage book study, book club, whatever you want to call it. That's We're starting that back up again. Hopefully, men, you've done your reading. And uh, that's at 4 p.m. this afternoon, 4 p.m. this afternoon. And, uh, and hopefully those that are, I know there are some that are taking care of, uh, of kids and they've kind of worked it out so that they'll be able to be there this afternoon. And uh, so looking forward to the discussion on that. And I, and I do want to say, if you're a wife and uh, you haven't had any conversations about this, this book that we're studying, my, at, just ask your husband, because the book is good for both husband and wives as it goes through Ephesians chapter 5 and principles there. And uh, I just that would be a good thing. So I know the men are getting together. But wives, it would be good to engage your husbands. Husbands, please engage your wives. That would be a good thing. Why don't we go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Larry, would you just uh, open us up in a word? Amen. All right, Brother Nick, come again and lead us. All right. Stand with me again and turn to hymn number 419, The Solid Rock, hymn number 419. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Oh, 
We're going to go ahead and get ready for uh, the offering. If you're a guest with us this morning, we're grateful for your attendance. There's no need for you to, to give. Uh, we have a gift if you haven't gotten one and just a little connection card where you can put in your information. But other than that, it's really all, all we're asking for. And this is really for our members an opportunity to, to give. Let's go ahead and now and ask for God to, to bless that. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that we can stand uh, on your son, Jesus Christ, the rock, uh, Lord, that we don't have to, to come and and, and through the imaginations of, of man, uh, create uh, facades to, to stand on that, that uh, are, are, are no truth. But, Lord, we have your word, uh, truth itself. I'm so grateful for that. I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we uh, give, Lord, that you would bless the, the gift and the giver, that you would use it uh, for your purposes. Lord, as, as we think about the Church Planners Conference coming up next week, we think about uh, those that are planning churches, that you would be with them and help them, uh, the church planners that we support, as well as the foreign missionaries. Lord, we pray that your word would have free course through them and that uh, and they would be able to reach people and uh, just do, do marvelous works. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. comes up again I just want to say you know uh, yes Jesus loves me and uh, you may think oh man that's just a kid song that has such truth to it yes Jesus loves me for the Bible tells me so uh, I'm telling you we're we're never too old for that truth so thank you Miss Leah brother Nick stand with me one more time for our last two songs this morning Hymn number 525, Little is Much When God is in It. All three verses, starting on the first. In the harvest field, not by good, there's a word.
we need to bring it up technically a little bit. So let's bring it up just a couple steps and then we'll hit it again. So here we go. So I tell you what, I think we're going to not have junior service. All of her kids are sick except one. Yeah, I know. She's like, don't look at me. <laughs> um, so I think we'll, we'll skip junior service today. And, uh, and I, I said this in growth class, but just so you know, there is a Purell dispenser right back there that uh, please feel free to use as we've had uh, lots of people uh, in church and just I, I know in people's workplaces and schools have been sick and so we want to make sure we, we take every precaution to stay healthy as much as possible. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and get into our worship time. If you're new with us, it's simply a time where we uh, the piano plays and we have an opportunity to worship God. I love Psalm 95 verse 6 and it says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Now, it would be odd if you came to a worship service and, and there wasn't an opportunity to appropriately worship God. And so we're going to give you an opportunity to do that and, and not necessarily to thank him for all the things that he did this week, although I'm sure he did some things for you this week, just to, to acknowledge that he is the Lord of creation. He is sovereign over all and that it's right for us to worship him. And so uh, we'll give you time to pray. I'll come and conclude us in prayer, and then we'll get into the text today.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we conclude in prayer, I want to thank you. Uh, as we looked at in growth class, thank you for your holiness. Lord, thank you for your love. The, the majesty of creation that we see is simply a, a, a minor reflection of you. Lord, that you are glorious. You, you are above all. That you are a holy other. And yet you love us. You care for us. Lord, I'm so grateful for that. You desire to, to have a deep relationship with us even when we push you away. And Lord, I pray that today you would help us to see who you are from your word. Lord, you would help us to see who we are and our, our desperate need for you. Lord, and that we would grow, grow closer to you, conform to the image of your son, and Lord, that you would be pleased. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. Open up to 1 Corinthians. We're, uh, let's see here, message number 37 in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 15, the end of chapter 15. There's one chapter left. And so we're going to be starting at verse 50. If you find your spot, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, if you would stand, if you're willing and able, just for the honor of the reading of God's word, there's, we're not required to do this. There's no special grace or anything when we do this, but just to acknowledge uh, God's perfect word as we read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, we'll read through the end of the chapter. Paul says to the Corinthian church, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray one last time and, and we'll begin. Lord, I, I pray that you would give me a clarity of mind and just your spirit would uh, direct, Lord, and you would have power in the lives of the hearers. And uh, Lord, that you would, you would change all of us, that you would uh, help us to grow. Lord, and that you would get the glory for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So, chapter 15 of the 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the, the, the Corinthian church there, is, is really one thought, if you will. It's one clear argument, um, but we've broken it up into several sections because there's so much meat, there's so much truth there, and here we are at the conclusion of of this entire chapter and uh, he's really wrapping everything up and now he started the chapter uh, if you remember kind of growth class we, we covered just the very very opening of this letter where he says that they are sanctified and called to be saints it says they're sanctified or hagia, uh, hagiazo and that they are hagias that they are holy so they're they are holy and they're called to be holy I mean they're saved they're set apart they're sanctified by Christ and yet there's some work God needs to do in their life to not just positionally have them ready for heaven, but to have them be conformed into the image of Christ and made more like the divine. And so he sets through with a numerous number of issues, right, that the church needs to deal with. Um, there's open, unrepentant sin, and some of them were puffed up. They, there's uh, uh, relational issues within the church, factions and schisms. There's uh, a, a, a unhealthy and sinful focus on self and trying to get above others. 
just, I mean, the list goes on and on. We've, we've covered most of them. And now, as he gets into chapter 15, he's dealing with one specific issue, which is uh, the resurrection of the believer. And he starts off in chapter 15 talking about the surety of the gospel. The gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. And, I, and I've said this probably every time in dealing with chapter 15, but we go to chapter 15 as proof of the resurrection because the numerous list of witnesses of the, the resurrected Christ. Yet, he, Paul didn't write this to prove the resurrection he wrote it to remind them. He said, wherein ye stand. That's what you believed. That's where you stood. This is the truth, the foundational truth of the gospel. And so this wasn't to convince them. It was simply to remind them. And so he reminds them of the simple fact that all of Christianity, whether it was Paul's message, the Corinthian believers, what they believed, the, what the apostles preached, all of Christianity is built upon the truth of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. You, that is the foundation of the faith. And they didn't deny that. They denied the ramifications of that, which uh, they believed Jesus rose from the dead, but they didn't believe that they would or that others that were saved would. And Paul says that even though they're not denying the resurrection of Christ, their denial of their own resurrection put the entire Christian life and belief in jeopardy. Because Doctrine is connected, right? The, the Bible is interconnected with its truths. It's not simply a, a truth here and a truth there. All these truths work together because it's God who authored it, right? It is, it is a, not simply a, a, a numerous sampling of, of man's wisdom. It is God uh, setting forth what has happened and what will happen for the redemption of mankind. And so uh, if believers don't rise from the dead, then neither did Jesus and if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he says, we're of most men miserable, right? Your Christian life is, doesn't count for anything if Christ didn't raise, rise from the dead. And if you're denying the resurrection of the believer, that's in effect denying that core doctrinal truth. And then he goes on to argue for the reasonableness of the bodily resurrection of believers, giving analogies of uh, uh, agrarian society and seed, and that uh, the seed must die, and heavenly bodies versus earthly bodies, and the differentiation of them, and highlighting this truth. While the resurrected body will be different, right? It will not be earthly, but it will be glorified. There, the identity of the body will be continuous. Just like it was the same Jesus that rose again, right? And he could point to the uh, wounds, right, uh, in his flesh from the cross. It will be the same you, in a glorified body, meaning there's continuity with you as a believer, right, in what you do in this life. You're, you're not going to magically be somebody else. It's still going to be you, but you're going to have a glorified body. That's why he exhorts them to awake to righteousness and sin not. Paul gives us the certainty of this truth on the basis of Christ's heavenly body. So he's now about to put the capstone on his argument or the resurrection of the believer, why it's important in a broader context, and what it ought to drive in the Christian life. So he says the resurrection as transformation is absolutely necessary because of who we are and because of who God is. Because of who God is. That's how we essentially start. It says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now, just a quick note. Flesh and blood there, there's, there's several different theories here where he's talking about flesh and blood, meaning those who are alive versus corruption, those who are dead. Th that's not what the text is saying. Flesh and blood is a common Semitic idiom, you know, what the Hebrews would use for, uh, like, your living body, right? Bodies. And, and I think the very generic reading of that gives you that idea, which is, hey, how we are today cannot inherit the kingdom of God because corruption doesn't inherit incorruption. And here's why. We looked at it last hour, and I, I always get so excited when uh, God does this and he aligns uh, teaching because I don't do it. I'm not smart enough to do it. Uh, we're going through holiness in growth class, and last week we covered the flesh. What do you know? Man, that lined up exactly with what we were talking about and uh, what we are and what we're going to be. 
this week we covered holiness. And, and this is exactly what we see. Why does corruption or flesh and blood unable to inherit the kingdom of God? Because God is holy. God is holy, and quite simply, we are not. So it's incorruptible. He's, his heaven is forever. It's perfect. It's imperishable. So, and so must those be who enter his kingdom. See, God is set apart. His ways are not our ways. His, he's perfect in his righteousness. Matthew 5, 48 says, Well, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Right? Psalm 18, 30 says, As for God, he, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a buckler, buckler to all those who trust in him. Psalm 145, 17, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. See, there is a difference between God and man. That should be evident. But I think more and more today, that, that message needs to be communicated. There is a difference between God and man. And if we're here in growth class, we spent some time looking at holiness and the fact that holiness is so much a part of God's nature, who he is, that we define holiness as being like God or mirroring right God in our life. He is holy, but we're not, to say it in a word. We're, we're corrupted. We looked at the flesh last week, but our body is corrupted and that when God said that the day that eat of the fruit, you shall die, he, he told the truth. He told the truth, right? There is a process that happens. Uh, I don't know exactly when the you know, inflection point of the curve hits, but uh, we're growing and then we're dying. And that's, sorry, that's how our bodies work after the fall. And after they die, they decompose and they return to the dust from which they came. The Corinthians were right in one respect, and they, how could uh, the 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 how could the dead enter into heaven? I, I mean, you know, we went through the the arguments last week, which is well, what happens if you're in a fire? How could you have a how could you have a resurrected body? I mean, if your body was consumed, well, what happens if you completely de decompose? What's the difference, right? Um, and so their idea was. How could the frailty of our humanness and our human body and our flesh ever enter into heaven? And in that respect, they were right. It, it can't. Corruption cannot inherit in corruption. What, what they didn't take into account is the transformational power of God, right? And that was, that was what, what Paul focused on last week. But we have an old man. We have corruption. It's not just that our body, our flesh and blood is, is corrupted. It, our, our old man, the, the, the retained vestiges of the sin nature, continue to exist. Ah. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. The works of the flesh, which, by the way, you can still manifest, manifest, not manifest, manifest after you're saved. Maybe that's a new word. We're going to coin it. You're manifleshing. That's, I don't know. Uh, so if you see somebody in sin, you're manifleshing. Uh, maybe not, but Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So can, can you be an adulterer and be saved. Absolutely. Absolutely you can. That, but you're manifesting the flesh. You're not manifesting the spirit. Um, there's a problem though. Uh, the old man, as is with sin nature, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, yeah, you're saved and you're positionally saved and you're sanctified in, in Christ Jesus. Uh, you are pronounced innocent uh, from a, a, a legal perspective. But for the actual entrance of your body into the kingdom of God, something needs to happen. Something needs to happen. You, you can't go as is. You need to be completely rid of the old man. For without that, there would be no entrance into a perfect heaven with a perfect God because we are not yet perfect. And, and again, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at some in Christendom who would claim that, that one, a sinner, could attain such perfection prior to Christ's transformative, complete transformative work in our life. I, I just don't understand that. That does not match up with any reality I've ever seen. So we need to be changed. We need to be perfected. And Paul says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a mystery. A mystery. A mystery is something that was uh, God's truth that was previously unknown. 
So, not formally known or understood. Now, whether living or dead, this transformation must take place. So, look at verses 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's not talking about taking a nap. He's talking about dying. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, we, we look at this, and, and we can look at this from the concept of the rapture and the timing of do the dead in Christ rise first, and, and then those that are alive, and, and that's what it says. Although Paul's not writing this um, really to give us detail about timing or anything about the rapture, he's writing it for a very specific purpose. All need to be transformed. That's the point. Whether you're dead in Christ or you remain living, everyone must be transformed to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, he gives us a glimpse into how that's going to happen uh, along with what we see in Thessalonians. But he says, look, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. There's going to be a transformation of the dead and then those that remain. And he says, we, and so some people would say, well, did Paul expect to be alive when Christ returned? I think Paul uh, had the idea that Christ will come at any moment, just like we should all have. And so he writes, we, as in those Christians that are alive today that should be ready for the return of Jesus Christ. By the way, that's if you're saved today, we're part of the we, right? Christ could return. There's, you, you need more preaching on this, too. Christ could return at any moment. Um, right? Be not deceived, right? God is not mocked. The fact that he hasn't returned doesn't mean that he will not. He is coming again. He is coming again. When? No idea. So we ought to live like he's coming within our lifetime. For sure. For sure. And so that's exactly what Paul does. And he says, we're all going to be transformed, whether... Uh, basically, hey, the need for transformation doesn't pass when you die, right? No, that still needs to happen. Or the need for transformation doesn't just happen when you die, right? If you're alive. Everybody, everybody needs to be transformed. And think about this. Certainly you can't, there's, there's in, our, in our current culture, there's a big like zombie culture, and I don't really understand that. But like it's not going to be, the resurrection of the dead is not going to be like the zombie movies and culture and everything that you see where it's reanimated corpses. No! It, and, and I think that was part of the, the Corinthians kind of view. How in the world could the dead rise? Right? No. It's the transformative power of Christ that we're going to see. And it's going to happen in an instant. It's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. I, I don't, somebody recently told me that they saw ice twinkle. I don't, think, I don't know that I've ever seen ice twinkle. But the point is instantaneous. And then here's, here's what I find interesting when people want to talk about <coughs> the sequencing of the dead in Christ rising first versus those who are alive. It's all happening like this. So it, it's, it's almost at the same time. Um, so we can talk about that, but his, his point is that there is universally a need for transformation because God is holy, we are not, and we are corrupted. He gives in 53, verse 53, a summary. For this, is corrupt, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortality must put on immortality. Right? We need to be changed. The resurrection is a necessity to have eternal life with the Father. They didn't understand that, and their denials denied their very future existence in heaven. N not, not in that they weren't saved, not that type of a denial, but it denied the truth of it, that then goes through and affects all of their thinking. All of their thinking. See, the resurrection is necessary because of what it finally destroys. It finally destroys death. And we saw that for Christ, certainly it destroyed death. Revelation 1, 17 through 18 says, And when I saw him, John the Revelator says, uh, I'm not even sure I like that title, the Revelator. He, it was revealed to him. I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his, his hand, right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. He is he that was alive and was dead and is alive forevermore. He conquered death. 
Acts 2.24, it says, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, right? Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it, as Peter preaches. But not just for Christ. Again, they, they believed that. Not just for Christ, though, for every believer. So when this corruptible have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, the great foe of humanity since the fall. Uh, is, is it not? Um, if, if you were to ask people what they were afraid of, um, almost invariably it goes back down to death. Now, maybe it's spiders, but it's because they're going to die. I don't know. But um, snakes, snakes are bad. I'm just, I, I have biblical support, Genesis 3, snakes are not good. But um, that's why Western washing is magical. Very few poisonous things. It's wonderful. But why, why, do, we, why do we fear those things? We fear them because of death, right? Death is the ultimate foe. But death is exactly what is swallowed up in victory. Death, the great foe since the fall of humanity, the result of sin is swallowed up in victory for believers through Jesus Christ, right? The resurrection of Christ and certain of then of the believers, the final proof of the victory over death when the dead in Christ shall rise. How magnificent, right? Why in the world would you want to deny a truth that leads to the victory over death, the victory over the one thing that everything fears, that everyone fears. Because the resurrection is both true and sure, the power of sin is gone. I love Paul, right, because he's not going to waste an opportunity to drop some theological truth, right, as he's describing it. He says, death in your life has a guaranteed future defeat. That's what the resurrection wipes it out, the resurrection of Christ, right, guarantees that. And he says there's coming a time, it's for sure, it's going to happen, that death will be swallowed up in victory. Therefore, death has no sting. Now, sometimes this uh, passage will be used in, in funerals. Make no mistake, we can sorrow in the death of others. It is still sorrowful because we miss them, right? Because... Um, I, why, why, why is it important that death is, has lost its sting? Because death hurts, not just for the ones that die, but for the ones that remain, right? We, 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 it, it's a sorrowful thing. So he's not saying that there's no sorrow in death for, for certainly. You know, some people say, well, a Christian uh, memorial, that ought to be a happy thing. And, and in a sense, it is a happy thing. We call it a homegoing, right, because they're going to be with their Savior. But to deny that there's any sorrow is 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 just simply um, not true. I mean, when you look at 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 uh, even biblical examples of grief, right? So it's not saying it's not right to grieve, but he is saying that there the ultimate pain of death no longer exists, right? That we have a hope that our loved ones we will see them again in heaven. That our loved ones are in a better place, and that it's not platitudes. And the sting is taken away. In that respect, the grave does not win. This means that our, if our loved one that is saved dies, although we can sorrow and miss them, there's no despair for this venomous, the, there's no venomous thing, right? They will rise again, and this is such a core and comforting truth for the believer, but the, here's the theological ramifications. The sting of death is sin, he says. The strength of sin is the law. But we have victory over sin because of Jesus Christ. Preben Vang, a commentator, summarized the theological truth this way. He said, sin is aroused by the law and results in death. Death is the wage of sin. Paul's point in verses 56 through 57 is to stress that since the sting of death has been removed, sin has lost its power to remove believers from God's presence. The resurrection that awaits gives evidence that Christ's followers have died to the power of sin and been made alive to the presence of God. The victory has already been won. So you see, what the truth of the bodily resurrection says that eventually, right, God will uh, have complete victory over, uh, over death. That complete victory over death in the future necessitates, right, that sin is no longer active uh, as a controlling power in my life today. It's all connected theologically. He says, you need to get this. You need to get this says, condemnation has been removed and new life from God's spirit is broken through. 
These are deep doctrinal truths that the Corinthians were missing or not understanding the full weight of because of their denial of, of, of the uh, believer's bodily resurrection in the future. And, and here's the, the, the core point that, I, that I, we need to understand, which is all throughout this whole chapter, they, they affirmed the core belief of the resurrection of Christ. And they uh, disavowed, didn't believe, however, whatever you want to say, the idea of what seemed like a secondary doctrine, the believer's resurrection. And Paul painstakingly throughout the chapter points out that what seems like a secondary issue, a secondary doctrine, is tied in every way, right, to the whole story of and, and, and a process of redemption of mankind, and that denying what seems like secondary, you will ultimately deny what is primary. Now, there are a lot of people today that seem to want to focus. We, we just need to focus on the, the core doctrines, and it, everybody has a different way of discussing what they think the core beliefs or core doctrines of, of Christianity are. What, what, this, what Paul is saying in this chapter is that, yeah, the, the, the gospel, the be- death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, absolutely core. But everything <laughs> is driven from that. And to try and differentiate that which is essential versus non-essential, if you uh, take a bunch of stuff as non-essential and you don't care about it, it's going to impact what is essential. We can be assured of the resurrection because it's of its necessity for our entrance into heaven. We can be assured of our freedom from sin because of the resurrection's sure defeat of s- death. All of that is due to the power and sacrifice of our Savior, right? It's all in Jesus Christ, he says. Thus, by denying the resurrection of the believer, they were denying the power of Christ in their lives, both now over sin and at his return in a physical existence in the kingdom of God. It was all related. Paul ends the chapter on a high note, though with the necessity of the resurrection to conquer death in the believer's life, and our eternal entrance into the physical kingdom of God, and the defeat of sin. I, it is a high note. That's awesome stuff, not only in the future, but now. Sin has been defeated. You're going to have an entrance into an incorruptible, wonderful, amazing, perfect heaven, and you'll have a body to match it. That's good news through Jesus Christ, if you're saved. That's good news, right? That is good news. But it's, he doesn't say this to give them warm fuzzies in the tummy. You know, it's like, oh, I just, I, I feel all warm and fuzzy now, and yay, that's good, because I was starting to get sad. No, that's not, that's not why he writes this, right? Um, he's, he, he basically says these truths uh, are, are of the gospel are meant to drive application, application for the Corinthian church as well as for us. So last week's text was a message of hope that there was a coming transformation, right? And even though we don't always live righteously and uh, and, uh, uh, awake to righteousness and sin not, which is what he said, although we don't always do that, there's a hope that we are going to be transformed and our our efforts are not in vain, okay? Our efforts to moral purity and living like God are not in vain. There is coming a time where that will happen, where we will be transformed. But now there is uh, coming a time of perfection. There is a call for believers right now. So he says, in, in this summary of application for the entire chapter, beloved brethren. It's interesting, right? I mean, he's the heart of Paul. He's hammered them issue after issue. Why? Because they're sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. He wants them to reach and aspire to their calling for God, and he loves them. He started this church. He spent 18 months, right, with this church, and he loves them. And although he's rebuking them, right, he says, my, my brothers and sisters, right, my beloved brethren, he wants the best for them, and this, this is what he tells them. Be steadfast. Be steadfast. Unmovable. Let me actually read it instead of doing it from memory. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
Let's break that down. This is the application of the entire chapter of the fact that, look, yes, the gospel, you believed it, but there's more to doctrine. Do not give away doctrinal truth. It'll erode what your foundation is. He says, be steadfast. That means be firm. In secular literature, outside of the Bible at this time, it's used to denote sitting, being seated, or settled. So here the Bible is speaking of being firm in the gospel. In the, this, the gospel, the context of chapter 15. Being firm in your doctrine, in what you believe. Firm in the belief of the facts, the implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well beyond the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Is that just true? It's foundational. But more than that, all of what that means. The resurrection of the believer, the call to righteousness of the believer. right? Awake to righteousness and sin not. God's perfect holiness. All of it. All of it. The idea is that you're not tiptoeing around doctrine, but you're planted, you're seated in it. People uh, are afraid of the word doctrine, seemingly, sometimes. Um, doctrine, what you believe about the Bible, right? And, and even if I were maybe to use a better definition, what the Bible says about itself. Because there are a lot of people that believe some crazy stuff. What the Bible says about itself, about God, about you, right? That would be doctrine. Doctrine. It's not, it's not something for just for people in uh, Bible colleges or seminaries. It's for every believer, every Christian. Even doctrine that doesn't seem core to Jesus, like the resurrection of the believer, you're changing Christianity into something that is ineffective and logically inconsistent many times without knowing it when you stray away from even secondary doctrine, if we could use that word. It says, be steadfast. Know your doctrine. Learn your Bible. Make it a point to think through the ramifications of what the Bible says for you as a believer, for the lost, to better understand the character of God, to better understand your character, as we're doing in our, our series on holiness. We need to do that. And, uh, you know, it'd be easy to point to, to kids here know your bible read your bible but adults need it as much if not i won't say more everybody needs it the same to know your know your bible N not not because we're fulfilling a, a checklist for god not because we want to fulfill a, a, a righteousness quota so that we can make god happy or gain our entrance into heaven that, that's not the point the point is that this is the application of truth, that we should uh, know and embody this truth because of what Christ has done for us. He's taken away uh, uh, the victory of death, right? He's taken away the power of sin in our life. It's a wonderful thing. And let us uh, uh, be engrossed in that truth such that it, what he says here, it's going to change our lives. It's going to change how we live and what we do. Know your Bible. It, it's amazing the human condition, which is, we went through New Year's goals uh, recently, and not everybody shared them, but I don't know, 80% of people probably had some type of a goal about being more consistent in their Bible reading. And, and that's not to call anybody out, right? That's to say, I don't care how mature you are in your Christian walk, um, that's probably going to be an issue that maybe not this year, but in times and depending on your schedule and everything else, you're going to have to work on to be consistent, to know God's word. And, and by the way, you know, I've been saved for 50 years. Well, there's still more to learn. There's still more to soak, right? There's, there's, there's endless truths here for us to get out. We've never arrived. We've never arrived. Know your doctrine. You know, <coughs> many churches use a tagline about their Sunday morning preaching being relevant. If you look at a lot of marketing, relevant sermons. Almost as, as though they're saying normal preaching from the Bible isn't relevant. But, <laughs> but we make sure it fits where you're at. And then they proceed to uh, only preach on grace, finances, relationships, other things that you know, people would identify as relevant or useful in their life. And the Bible has much to say about those topics, and, and that's wonderful, and we should incorporate all that into our lives, and it should be preached on. But friend, all of the Bible is relevant. All of the Bible is relevant. All doctrine is relevant for our daily lives. M many don't believe that today. 
just like some uh, believe certain parts of the Bible is more authoritative, uh, many believe that we don't need to be steadfast in all of our doctrine. We just need to come together on the important things. Just the core stuff. Remember, they didn't deny Christ arose. That wasn't the denial. They denied that they would. And Paul tied all of that up to show them all of the deficiencies in their belief, which led to deficiencies in how they lived because of that. Certainly, this seemed secondary, but it wasn't secondary. Christ's victory over death for the believer, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the old nature, all of those were impacted. Do you get to the passages ever in your Bible reading that seem less relevant, the more doctrinal, sometimes tune out? I, I, I've, I've been there. I remember when I got saved, and uh, I was challenged to read through the book of John, and I got saved, and then I was, I was told to read through the book of Romans. I didn't get a lick of it. I just didn't understand it. Uh, to be honest with you. And I, I mean, that was where I was at spiritually. But uh, there are times, you know, where you're just like, well, I've, you know, it's Paul and he's making some really big argument that I don't quite understand. Don't tune out. Like, study to show thyself approved. Like, it can take work, right? If you've ever said, I don't get much out of the preaching. If God's word is being opened, then that's a reflection of your heart. God's word will not return void. His Holy Spirit uses his word, all of it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, mature, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you have no taste or a limited palate, for doctrine, you're not steadfast. You're not steadfast. Now, you can have questions and be steadfast, but the spirit of the questions identify where you're at. Do you really want to know so that you can be properly seated in doctrine? Or are you asking like the Corinthians, how were the dead raised up? And with what body? That would not be an appropriate right attitude. We're called to be firmly planted, seated in doctrine. Seated. And he says, unmovable. So w- once you're seated, you're called not to move, not to waver, not to vacillate. Right? Change is good if your position is displayed to be biblically false. But other than that, we should be unmovable. There's a lot of pressure that can make you want to move. Think about social pressure. Already there's substantial pressure to legitimize and celebrate what the Bible calls wicked in our society. Whether you're in school feeling the effects of forced indoctrination or you're in the work environment dealing with employers who openly embrace and optimize for lifestyles that are absolutely against God. Will you move? Will you waver? Will you change your doctrine? Social pressure continues to erode the doctrine of church after church and denomination after denomination. The Bible says be unmovable because it matters. I mean, that's just a, it's a small second. I still believe the gospel, friend, your position on secondary issues will affect your position on primary. What about political pressure, though? There's coming a time when social pressure will turn into political pressure. It will. Where proclaiming the doctrine of the Bible, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man will result in political persecution. We've already seen cases of this in Canada, and there are calls for this in the U.S. Will you be unmovable if it isn't just society, but the weight of government that is against you? Start, starts to put it a little bit more in perspective, doesn't it? When God says, be steadfast and be immovable, you're like, yeah, I, I know what I believe. What happens when society is against you? What happens when the weight of government is against you? And ultimately, that leads to physical persecution. The world wants to stop those that proclaim and cling to biblical doctrine. Whether it was Stephen, the apostles, reformers that gave their lives for aspects of biblical truth, Christians in the communist USSR being tortured, murdered, or Christians today in the Middle East or India or any a number of places that actively suffer right physical persecution because they stand on doctrine. It happens today 
it will continue to happen. Paul referenced how he gave himself and his body for the gospel in this chapter. He was in jeopardy every hour, he says. He dies daily in the context of the threat, the, the, the physical threat, not of spiritual submission. There may come a time when we are physically forced to deny doctrine due to physical persecution. If not in my life, maybe my kid's life, if the Lord doesn't return, will we, like so many countless millions of Christians throughout time, be unmovable? That doesn't just happen. It, it doesn't just happen by happenstance. We must choose to be steadfast, unmovable. You must be grounded and seated in your Bible, in doctrine, for that. This is the result. This is the application that the Bible gives all for this purpose. Always be abounding in the work of the Lord. I love this quote. The surprising feature of this exhortation is that unlike before, where we're called to awake to righteousness and sin not, this is not directed toward ethical behavior, but toward the work of the gospel. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You, you already said awake to righteousness and sin not. Certainly that should happen. But the ultimate effect of understanding being seated in our doctrine, being steadfast, unmovable, is that we would abound in the work of the Lord. This, this is not simply living for Christ. This is ministry work. Could I say it a different way? What's the context of chapter 15? Gospel work. Abounding, if I could say it in this way, gospel work. The death, burial, resurrection of Christ for our sins. Not just ours, those who have accepted him, but the sins of the world. Right? That others would know. That they would be able to call upon Christ as their Savior. Because we don't have to worry about the effects of sin and death has been swallowed up in victory. We are steadfast, unmovable in our doctrine. And when you are that entrenched in the Bible and fixed on it, you will be moved to service for your Lord. You will be. When we <laughs> Proper doctrine, proper view of God and his word will lead you to service for him. When we understand that everything is based off of what Jesus did for us, and we start to plumb the depths of exactly what he did for us, uh, how it uh, affects us, and, and will result in us wanting to tell others. That's ministry. That we would bring others to biblical doctrine that the Holy Spirit would use to change their lives, whether it's because they get saved or whether it's because they, be, they begin to grow in Christ, or God uses that to call them into the ministry themselves in a vocational sense. So a natural and simple question. Are you abounding in the work of the Lord? Are you abounding in the work of the Lord? You get the abounding is not a word that we use often, but in excess, it's like bubbling out of you. I think about like a, a boiling pot, right? That's like been boiling a little too long. You got the lid on there and it's just starting to come out. Are you abounding? Is, does your life reflect? that idea how's your service for christ now he wrote to this local church first corinthians or uh, the corinthian church and he said that because of these truths and that because that they should be seated in their doctrine they should be unmovable from it and it should drive them to an abounding life of service right through the corinthian church for their lord have you delivered biblical doctrine to others this week now it sounds um hoity-toity Right, it kind of sounds like delivered biblical doctrine. You are giving them a tract, like told them that they could be saved. You don't have to use big words, right? That they're sinners and they need Christ and God loves them. Have you delivered biblical doctrine to anyone? Maybe it's not just the lost. Maybe it's a, a saved individual and uh, they're struggling with some sin in their life or they're struggling with with uh, growth. And delivered some, maybe it's just encouragement, biblical encouragement to somebody. All of those abounding in the work of the Lord. God wants to use you to deliver the whole spectrum of doctrine to both the lost and his children. It is, this is not just for uh, the preacher. This was for the entire church. That they would, that they would get this. How have you allowed God to use you? And if I could say it this way, mom, dad, if it's only in the context of your home, 
Certainly that is a role that we are called to lead our children. But if it's only in the context of your home, you're missing something. That's not abounding. Think about every area, right, that God has put you in. If, if you work outside the home, um, I, if you leave your house, I hope you leave your house. You're here, so you made it once at least, right? You go to the grocery store. What, all those, every interaction we have with somebody is an opportunity to abound in the work of the Lord. How are you serving him? This, this is like the pinnacle application of understanding appropriate doctrinal truth and believing it. He says it were to abound in the work of the Lord. By the way, coming to church is good. We're called to do it. Hebrews chapter 10. But that's not abounding in the work of the Lord. You can be smart and scholarly, know a lot about the Bible, still not be affected by it. The call isn't just to know the Bible, but to live it. And if the Lord's ministry is not abounding in your life, let me just say, we're not firing on all cylinders. We're not living what we're supposed to live. If the doctrine of the resurrection of the believer wasn't true, Paul says that our faith would be in vain. That's what he said earlier. Hey, if it wasn't true, our faith would be in vain. But it is true, and it is connected to Christ, and that we are, are his, right? He's conquered death, given us life, that we will bear the image of the divine, and that means that our work for him will not be in vain, right? The truth of the gospel means the truth of our resurrection, which means that we're currently freed from sin. All of those things are connected. It's all true. So we don't live a life of activity for God in vain. Our work for him, if it's done through him, will not be in vain. It's a wonderful thought. For it is certain that there is coming a time, whether through the grave or through the direct return of Christ, where our opportunity to serve him in that capacity will be done. When, when the Lord comes back, we, we do not have the same opportunity, right, to serve him in an earthly capacity. Now, we're going to be worshiping him in heaven. Praise the Lord for that. But our opportunity is limited. We're to be grounded, seated, right, fill ourselves with biblical truth and, and take that biblical truth and it should be like bubbling up out of us that we're abounding and delivering that to others so that they could experience the same thing that we have and if you're saved today you've been given the greatest gift that you could go to heaven be saved from your sins which you justly deserve because of rebellion from God that you can be saved without any work of your own. And to hide that gift and to hide that truth would be terrible. Would be terrible. If we truly love others, we need to be abounding in the work of the Lord. If we love God, we need to be abounding in the work of the Lord. So simple question. Where are you at today? I know God wants to work through you. Are you allowing him to? Are you allowing him to? Who, who in your life hasn't heard the gospel that, that you could deliver the gospel to? That truth. I'm pretty sure there's at least one person you know. Let's abound for the work of the Lord, that because knowing that it's not in vain. Knowing that it's not in vain. We'll go ahead and have heads bowed, eyes closed. However the Lord spoke to you this morning, We'll have the piano begin to play. I invite you to respond to God. Maybe, maybe you just need to be in your Bible more and to, to double down on doctrine, the understanding, the, the connectedness of, of his word, how it reflects God and how it affects you and how it affects others and to be able to share that. Maybe you need to take the step to abound in the service of God. Like that your life would be reflective as a servant for God. Maybe today you've never trusted in Christ. You've never been saved. I would love to take the Bible and show you 
how you could accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and, and that by faith alone you could be saved from the punishment of hell that, that we all justly deserve because of our rebellion from God, because of our sin. And that you too could experience the victory over death that Jesus Christ gives. That's piano plays. You can pray at your seat. You can pray at the altar. If you'd like to pray with somebody, you can have somebody pray with you. Just ask that you would respond to God. Here's the deal. Even if we want to abound in the work of the Lord, we need His help. We need His Holy Spirit. We need to submit to that and work through that such that we could do something for Him. Right, we'll go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for, uh, I, I'm so grateful that the Bible is not a, a book of man's wisdom with uh, pithy proverbs of how to make your life better, but it's a set of rich, connected truths revealing yourself to mankind that rejected you and your desire to be reunited with them. So much so that you sent your son to die for us. And Lord, that you would continue to work through them. Uh, I'm just so grateful for that. Lord, I pray that you would help us to submit, to, to come to you, that you would work through us in such a way that it uh, abounds. It is a char core characteristic of our life. Lord, not, not so we can brag to others, not so we can get spiritual brownie points, but, but just because it reflects your love for us. Lord, I'm so grateful for this truth. I pray that you'd work in hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Brother Nick, come and lead us in a chorus. Stand for the last chorus, hymn number 104. His name is wonderful. We'll just sing through the whole song one time. His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord, He is the mighty King, Master. missed.